Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to the Creative Quarantine Sessions, show number 12. As always, I'd like to give a shout out to my technical director behind the scenes, Mr. Alan Delinka, for also providing that live audience noise to make us feel like once again we are in a shared space. Wouldn't that be a dream? And Nathan Avakian, who composed our theme tune, welcome to the show. Uh, today we have a very special guest joining us, production designer for film. So um, without further ado, here's a little intro on K.K. Barrett. K.K. Barrett is an L.A.-based filmmaker working primarily as a production designer with some of the most creative minds in film today. With a background in music and painting, he found himself designing sets for such iconic music videos as Beck's New Pollution and Smashing Pumpkins Tonight Tonight both of which earned him the MTV Video Music Award for Best Art Direction. He then formed a creative partnership with Spike Jones, bringing to life the dynamic world of being John Malkovich in 1999. He has since designed a number of acclaimed films, including Her, earning him an Academy Award nomination, Where the Wild Things Are, and Adaptation, also for Spike Jones. Lost in Translation and Marie Antoinette with director Sofia Coppola, I Heart Huckabees with David O. Russell and Human Nature with Michelle Gondry. Other films include Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, The Goldfinch, and most recently, Harley Quinn, Birds of Prey. His commercial, his, his, excuse me, his commercial designs include spots for Nissan, GE, Levi's, Budweiser, Xfinity, Audi, and others. As a director, he's credited uh, he created the genre-defying mixed-media adaption of Kid Koala's graphic novel, Newphonia Must Fall, as well as the live theatrical event, Stop the Virgins, in collaboration with the multi-talented musical artist, Karen O. Oh. A report from Surface Magazine refers to our guest as a Hollywood production designer with punk rock roots, speaking his own language of emotion. It's an absolute thrill to have him here with us today. Please welcome Mr. K.K. Barrett. Hello. Hello, hello. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. So this week I had a little bit of a K.K. Barrett Film Festival going back and revisiting a number of the films. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't be so hard on yourself. One or two for the first time, actually. And I was struck by the range, um, 
by by the range of the work and and sort of the layers of emotion that that permeate throughout all the work. Um, I'm curious because we always got to start these conversations out to give context where you began. Uh, so take us back to to your beginnings um, in the world of of painting and sculpture. Um, I always I always felt like I could draw for my own enjoyment, and I think that that's a very good signifier of what you're able to do rather than just knowing you can execute a skill. Can you um, entertain yourself and then maybe you can entertain someone else with the same skill? Um, mm -hmm. So I always knew I could draw. I began painting and sculpting in college. And uh, towards the end of college, I, I started to uh, play music, learned how to play music and, and was playing music with my, my roommates, which were also painters. And, and then at the end of that, this was in the Midwest in Oklahoma, and uh, at the end of that course, I, uh, I moved to California. It was winter, and I had a notion to go to New York, but I, didn't, I want, wanted to escape winter, and I was in the middle of a winter in Oklahoma, so I went to California. And uh, immediately began playing music again, although my intent was to be a painter there. Mm. And somehow, uh, through the course of playing music, I started to make uh, small music videos, even though it was before MTV with directors. And uh, I volunteered to do the set design and began as a production designer, having not done anything else in film and not knowing what that word meant, nice. that title meant. Well, that's a good place to start. Yeah, <laughs> we have a picture here, Alan. If you want to bring this up from from your days uh, playing drums, um, <laughs> it's a great picture. Was this with the Screamers? This photo? Yeah, yeah. In the, in the late seventies. Yeah. Nice. Now, let me ask you a question. How does music influence the other art forms? So painting, sculpture, music, and eventually film. How, how do these art forms influence each other? Well, I think they're all the same um, pursuit of, of creative entity. I think that you're trying to make something that stands alone, uh, collaborating with others. You're solving problems. You're, you're editing things that you want to keep out and deciding what you want to celebrate and uplift and focus on. I, I really think they're exactly identical exercises. Unfortunately, I think that uh, music may be the most uh, elevated art form since it's the most consumable art form. Mm. You can, uh, it, can, it can hit your brain, it can hit you below the waist. Uh, you can absorb it while you're doing other things. You don't have to go to a place to, uh, to download it into your brain like you have to with film. Uh, and it's, it's an intangible emotional experience. Um, but I, and I think it educated me to what to look for in film. Nice. To, to think of film as an abstract, uh, emotional vehicle rather than just a set of, uh, visual decorations. Very good. Did you watch a lot of films growing up? Yeah, I was, I was a film nut. Yeah. Are there any titles that, that stand out as early inspirations for you? Um, uh, uh, there, was, there were so many. Touch of Evil, um, Orpheus, uh, uh, the Anto Antonioni films, Red Desert, um, Last Tango, 2001. Um, Cabernet I admit Cabernet that, that was Caligari. an unfair question. Oh, Caligari is great. Yeah, <laughs> that was an unfair question. <laughs> well, it's I an know, endless. It's an endless it is, answer. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's a rabbit hole. Actually, we could just spend the next hour and, or the next day, really, just going over titles yeah. of films. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so we're going to jump to uh, being John Malkovich. I know that some of your earlier films before that cheerleader camp and. Um, what was it? Crack house. <laughs> yeah. Those uh, were kind of training wheel, uh, 
Training Wheel Films. I, I had done uh, a feature film before that called Population One. That's the film that I volunteered to design, not knowing what it meant. And then the other films, um, I just took as kind of a gap. I, I, I never thought, after the first film, I never thought I'd work in film again. Not because it wasn't successful, although it was shelved for about 20 years. But mm. because I just thought it was one thing, you know, an experience I had, and I was moving on to other experiences. But once you've done one thing, um, you've solved a problem with little or no money, then somebody else wants you to solve that problem again. And I needed money, so these films were offered to me by friends, and I, and I did them. And each time I learned something, but it wasn't like I was trying to put a, a catalog of uh, goodness together. <laughs> right, right, right. We'll get into this as we go, but I said a bad word the other day when we first spoke. I said the word industry, and yeah. uh, and you corrected me by saying you feel it's really a lot more about just kind of creating with your friends, right? It is. I mean, all I, I've kind of pinballed through uh, a bunch of different creative experiences, always with friends, always uh, as an exploration and a journey. And I um, occasionally I would do something just because I was short on cash, but I would make sure that it was also an exploration and also uh, a bit of a journey. And so I'd find something in it for myself. And um, doing things with friends, you, then you just get passed from one friend to the next to the next. A lot of those directors that you mentioned, I kind of met in a very short burst of time because they were all doing things uh, parallel to each other. Mm. And so I, you know, industry, if, if you want to go and, and work on a, an assembly line, that's great. You'll, you know, you'll get, a, you'll get taken care of and you, you'll get a health plan and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, you really can't make a personal statement in, in, in that way. So yeah. I was more interested, if I'm going to put my time into this, in trying to make things that are a bit more unique. Mm. Very so good. industry, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's a theatrical set designer, or excuse me, costume designer whose name I will not mention on this program, but he's always considered himself a tradesperson. And I'm like, oh, come on, you know? <laughs> you know that's, 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 that's a funny thing. There's a lot of craft that goes into what we do and, uh, and elevating it, meaning that you're making it better, uh, not necessarily less rough around the edges because sometimes you want rough around the edges, but more in harmony with the other things that it has to coalesce with. Uh, that, that is a craft, but it's, it's more about ideas and, and intelligence and, and a, a craft sounds like something you only do with your hands and you're getting it ready for the, the fair down on the corner, you know? Mm. Um, Everybody puts a lot of effort and work into what they do, but uh, I'm, I'm more interested in the ideas than than effort. I, effort is matter of fact. I think everybody puts effort in. Yeah, absolutely. That's an even playing field. Hmm. Here's, a, here's an interesting thought before we move on to kind of the collaborative world of making films. When you were doing sculpture and painting, that's pretty much a solitary art for the most part, right? True. You in a studio kind of creating by yourself. So what are the major, what's the advantage of collaborative art versus solitary art? Um, exchange, uh, camaraderie, mm -hmm. you know, uh, getting to discover things and see the light bulb go off over each other's heads at different moments. And, uh, and, and playing uh, idea ping pong. You throw something out and it comes back differently than you expected. You, you give it back differently than they expected. Uh, the reason I went into music was because it was a less solitary endeavor. You know, I was a young man and, and uh, I was more gregarious than wanting to stay in a studio all day. Yeah. At the same time, when you begin a film, there's nothing more solitary than it's not completely solitary because you're working with a director, but uh, most of the work on a film, I feel like, comes in the first two weeks, if not a month, of preparing and deciding what channel you're going to focus on. 
Well, let's take a look, Alan, if you want to bring up the image here. Um, being John Malkovich opens with this, um, with this puppet dance. Um, puppets are something that have kind of popped up at a few different moments in your, in your career, as we'll explore. Uh, at this moment in time, in 1999, when, when you made this movie, how, had puppets been something that had appeared in your life before, or was this kind of... No. So, so this was a new, a new world for you to, to kind of create this, this um, kind of sub-world of being John Malkovich, right? Yeah, yeah. It was in the script. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a moment <laughs> that was particularly um, humorous to me. This is a, what Derek Mantini, the, the, <laughs> <laughs> the master puppeteer. How much room was there for invention for a gag like this? Oh, well, there's tons of room for invention. I mean, when they when they say how big it is, you have to start thinking of. Uh, I mean, and and this is you know early, fairly crude effects, but um, you have to start thinking of okay, how are they going to suspend that puppet? And then you start looking for a location that's dynamic to that suspension. Hmm. Uh, that's on the Colorado Street Bridge near Pasadena in, in Los Angeles. Um, you know, you, I love big ideas, uh, and I, I, I love working with and without limitation. Each one mm. can have their advantage. Absolutely. In that, in that particular film, there was lots of room for invention. Um, you know, I always, I always go by the, the mantra that the best idea wins, and so... If somebody else has a, you know, I come up with an idea to try and to elevate a situation. And if somebody else has a better idea, I'd, I'd gladly jump on that instead, no matter where it comes from, kind of egoless. Right. Um, I, I really am in service of the, uh, the story and the film trying, trying to elevate it. Mm -hmm. Were you working closely with uh, Charlie, the writer, on this as well? Charlie was around. I was working mainly with Spike. Um, yeah. Uh, I certainly, you know, uh, felt Charlie's presence and, and Spike was joined at the hip with him, but it was, it was Spike's film. Um, it was his attitude and it was his, uh, I mean, when you're looking at the seventh and a half floor, for instance, it was written as a much older building and Spike's idea was that it was maybe, you know, built in the 1800s or 1900s, but, but it was remodeled in the eighties because that's, that's his time frame of growing up and, and seeing office buildings. Mm. And so we embraced that. And that was, that was unique to his perspective, not Charlie's. So there's, there's filters. There's always, you know, uh, brilliant ideas coming from the script and then brilliant translations coming from the director and the team. Absolutely. Now this was actually invent invention on location, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, we didn't have the funds to build it. So we started looking for a location where you could uh, adapt it. And I found a U-shaped building uh, that had a, a large courtyard so that you had natural windows. You could look out the windows and look over to the other building where people were, were uh, working at a normal height. And uh, it gave you the, the distinction of you being compressed and them being expanded. And then you also start playing with the things like uh, he lived in a basement and this was Spike's idea again. So that here, here he is a guy that's he's broke and he's living in a compressed world and he goes to work at the only place that will have him at an even more compressed world. He's just going down and down by going up. Mm. Speaking of going down, the portal into John Malkovich's mind is filled with dirt to imply that somehow in this time space portal, you've wound up on the ground itself, even <laughs> though you're seven stories up. Uh, that was, that was my interpretation. Um, it was originally a little bit more alive than that and mysterious and, and organic, even though mm -hmm. you can't get much more organic than dirt. Um, and, and I just couldn't, cross that threshold into something that all of a sudden 
uh, I wanted to have the actors and the audience suspend belief when they went into this tunnel, but I didn't want them to go into a, a phantasm. Right. And so I wanted to literally ground them into something that was familiar. So if you're opening a mysterious door, like you're going into a crawl space under a house, and, and you dare yourself to continue, um, if it's familiar, if it's dirt, you, would, you might continue. And then as you go a little bit deeper, it's mud, and then you hesitate. But by that time, he's sucked into the tunnel. Mm. Too late to turn back. Yeah, so it was, uh, I, I thought it was a good solution of the unexpected and yet the, the tactile believable. Nice. A few years later, you collaborated with the same team on adaptation and uh, a moment I, I want to bring up here, which I find uh, quite amusing is the sort of meta layers of Charlie Kaufman, Kaufman's world where we wind up on the set of being John Malkovich. Now this time, an actual built set on a stage, right? Yeah, it became meta for me because I, then I had to, in the story, Kaufman and his brother were visiting the set of being John Malkovich. And uh, so we had to reconstruct the set, which was never a set before. Of course, I had lowered, I had lowered the ceilings and I'd built corridors and little offices uh, internally within that building. But the outside walls were always the real walls. When, when uh, you go out on a fire escape, the fire escape is really there. When you're in Dr. Lester's office and see traffic outside, it's really there. But in this mm -hmm. case, we were completely on set and it was false. And so I had to build the seventh and a half floor as a set for the first time. Nice. <laughs> Um, now, working with Charlie Kaufman um, and Spike Jones, Spike Jones in particular with that director-designer relationship, uh, what is the advantage to, I should say with any directors you've worked with multiple times, what is the advantage to ongoing collaboration and building a language together that you guys have that sort of shorthand established? Um, well, you begin to know each other's taste. Uh, Spike doesn't want to make a movie that somebody else has made, and, and, and neither do I. Mm. And I just feel like uh, he, he, he wants to make a story that's unique to this project, visually, emotionally, um, filmically, uh, you know, just something that stands out. It's, 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 it's a piece. It's not a companion to something else. It's not a also ran to another film. You can dismiss it or you can love it, but it's not just eh. So um, I was in sync with him pretty much on that completely. He's younger than I am. And I came to that team a little bit behind the other people, uh, the, other, the other regulars on the team. It was quite a team for a while. And, uh, but we, we all anchored ourselves in this believability so even though we were doing fantastic stories, uh, courtesy of Charlie Kaufman, um, they were anchored in kind of a mundane reality. Mm. And believe it or not, that's, that's something that's hard to, uh, hard to hold on to. That one of the biggest jobs of a, a production designer is to make sure that the, the film is consistent from scene to scene and throughout the whole project so that it doesn't go off on tangents that aren't desired and it holds together as a piece. Um, and having the shorthand with Spike really helped that because we both knew what was accepted and what, what wasn't accepted. Mm. And we would make rules uh, and then we would break our own rules, but the rules guided us at least, you know, halfway through. Yeah. And as production designer being one of the first to, to join the team early on, you are also sort of thinking about every other individual person's job on the film, right? And kind of laying the groundwork for what that world will be. What are the parameters? Yeah, it, it, it's true. I mean, um, I would, if, if a DP wasn't on as early as I was and we knew who it was and always I did, I would always check in with them and tell them what I was up to and say, what do you think about this? And what do you think about this? And, and make sure that, we weren't committing to anything that would box them in 
and allowing their ideas to come forward too. It always frustrates me when DPs aren't as aren't, aren't on as early as production designers because it's mm. crucial to work together with them. Yeah. I'd like to jump now to uh, one of my personal favorite films. This is uh, Lost in Translation. Um, this was your first collaboration with Sofia Coppola, yes? Yes. Uh, so in this film, we see a lot of, um, of kind of the journey of these two people alone and together exploring Japan. So what was your relationship like with Sofia in finding these sort of moments that could illustrate their time in this kind of unknown place? This was an interesting project. Um, it was started by Anne Ross, a really good friend of Sophia's, who ha had worked with Dean Tavalaris, a great production designer. Uh, but she had to leave because her father was ill. And so she had prepped for a couple of weeks and, and set up the hotel and, uh, and found a couple locations, but then had to leave. And I was in the middle of a, a big commercial project. And I got the information from Sophia and said, yes, I'll come and do it. They were already there, but I couldn't arrive until the night before we started shooting. Mm. And so I show up in the morning and everybody, who's this? There was an art department there for a month with no one to guide them. And, uh, I would meet the, meet the team in the morning, open the set, and then I'd go out and look for locations. And it was a very informative, I'd, I'd been to Tokyo once before and met some of the characters in the film that, that were friends of Sophia's. Uh, and I, I took the film as a, a journey as a character in the film. I, w I played, I imagined I was Charlotte. And I was going around and anything that was intriguing to me, uh, I thought was good for her to see and have in the film, if it was scripted or unscripted. Um, I'm not saying that I was writing the script. I'm saying that I was filling in location backgrounds for things that were already in the script mm. and things that, that struck our eye and, and thought were entertaining and illuminating to an audience that had never been there so that they could be on Charlotte's journey. I thought that was really important. And so I would go out and find locations, then I'd come back and, and show everybody the things at night, and, and then we would go out and look for uh, karaoke bars all together. That was quite an adventure. <laughs> did, you, did you get some uh, actual karaoke in while you were doing it? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Bill's a bit of a mic hog. He loves karaoke. <laughs> well, it definitely so shows in the film with the uh, Elvis Costello. <laughs> yeah, no, he's he's great. He was really great, and uh, he was on his own. He didn't have any handlers or anything like that, and he was always taking care of us and and bringing us up to his hotel room to watch the World Series and oh, nice taking us out for drinks and stuff. He was really wonderful. So, the real reason we brought you here today, what is it that's whispered at the end of that film? I wasn't there. <laughs> there's um, a certain there's a certain amount of filmmaking that, that the curtain should never be pulled back on. Absolutely. Um, when when things like that happen, and for the, for you to bring that up, uh, the you know the the sneakers and Marie Antoinette and things like oh, that. Yeah. That that makes people that makes an audience participate in a film. Yes. They're not being told what's going on. Mm. They're given breadcrumbs. They're given puzzles to solve. And I think it's really important to participate in a film. I think that's what would keep cinema alive is uh, creating films that are not simply passive entertainment, right? Yeah. I like to be entertained. But part of being entertained to me is thinking. Absolutely. Trying to second guess or, or forward guess. Yeah. Well, that... Uh, that brings me to, to a question that's, that's always sort of on my mind. I ask this of myself and pretty much any creative person I know, how much of your job is about providing a mirror or a canvas for the audience to apply their own experiences to? I think uh, that's a really good question. I think it's, uh, it's difficult. I, I think it's a big obligation 
I've worked on a couple of things that were books and they're translated into scripts and then they're translated into films. And, and I use the example of when you read a book, everybody imagines the written description differently because they have different visual experiences and different visual uh, ability to absorb things, be curious about things, understand uh, visual information. So where you can describe a room or the city in a book, uh, everybody would have a different vision of it depending on what their own experiences are or how exacting those words uh, resonated with them. In film, we might have you know, 30 seconds, 15 seconds behind an actor to give that same impression. Mm. And that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to support the, the, the story by these glimpses into what surrounds an actor and what surrounds the character in the story uh, that affects their journey on this particular uh, storyline. Mm. So yeah. it's, I think it's very important. I think it's very important to sometimes st as, as a piece of scenery, step away to make sure that nothing is clouding the actor. I think that sometimes uh, if there's a beat that you have to step forward and grab the audience's attention again, and that may be an editorial solution, that may be a music solution, that may be a, a design solution. And I think that the whole filmmaking uh, curve is a set of dynamics. And each one of those different crafts, we'll use that word, each one of those different disciplines <laughs> can, can uh, make you focus again within the story. Yeah. So stepping back, that's interesting you said that. I think that's a, that's a big piece of, of the puzzle. I, I know in the past you've said making creative decisions can apply to anything if you step back a bit. Um, do you sort of consider creativity to be a universal trait? Is it something that everyone has within them? Yes. It, uh, I had a very sad confrontation. I was at a, a school, a design school. And I was giving a presentation and, and kind of an overview of work. And instead of that, I really wanted to just talk about creativity and where ideas come from and what you can do with them. And a graduate student asked me a question towards the end of the talk and says, like, where, you know, like, where, where do you get all your ideas? And I, I thought that was the saddest question. Mm. Um, because when, when you look at how kids play, they're full of ideas. They're constantly imaginative. Uh, they're constantly amazed at finding something around the corner, the way I was trying to be amazed when I was out looking at locations in Tokyo. Um, curiosity is the number one driver of ideas. Mm. Why are things like they are? How do they end up where they are? How do they, why, do, why do they sit next to each other? Why is something missing? I know there's something missing there. And um, if you can build those curiosity blocks and give them to an audience, they become ideas. Yeah. I've heard it said, and it's terribly sad, everyone is creative, everyone is curious until they're told they are not or they can't be. That's, that's what it sounded like when I was hit with that question. It's like, what, you know, like, I don't understand. Like, how, how do you not have ideas? What a punishment. I, 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 th <laughs> I think it's a, it's a muscle. I think you have to exercise that muscle. I think if you uh, want ideas to come, uh, just, you know, let yourself get blank and, and, and start looking for them. And they yeah. can be other people's ideas. Um, sometimes when I'm, I'm a bit blank, I'll pick up a book, a visual book or, or, a, or a book of text, and within about a half a page, I've, I see the ideas that they had, but then I jump to ideas of what I would do with that instead. Mm. 
And I think that's a very important thing is, is thinking what somebody else would do with an idea instead. When I'm working as a designer, I always try to think of what the director's choices are going to be. <clears throat> I try to think of everything that they have to decide and then I decide how I would do it. Right. Not to step in their way, but to be able to contribute to the conversation when that, that question comes around. Like, what would you do here? How would you solve this? Well, I was thinking of this. And then you go like, oh, that's a great solution. Or no, 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 that's not right at all. You know, it doesn't matter. But you, you've already exercised being in tune with the process of creativity. Absolutely. I want to jump now to a film um, with, that you did with Sofia Coppola, Marie Antoinette. Um, we have a little model image here. I'm excited to say I don't really know what I'm looking at. So can you share a bit about what this is and how this helped you kind of solve some problems? I knew that I was on my way to make where the wild things are. Mm. And I knew that uh, Marie Antoinette was bubbling up too. And I was thinking that I was going to come to a confrontation where I had to choose between which director to, uh, you know, follow the project with. And as it turned out, and at this time, unfortunately, Spike and Sophia were no longer together. And so it was going to be a, a really hard decision to make. Um, off of the success of Lost in Translation, Sophia got Marie Antoinette and it somehow got on a fast track and Spike's movie wasn't ready to go yet. So I had to call Spike and say, Spike, uh, I know we were going to do wild things in a couple months, but all of a sudden, um, you know, Marie Antoinette is ready to go right now and I'm ready to leave to move to Paris. Mm. And... Uh, can you tell me that Wild Things is going to go now? And he said, no, I can't. And it turned out that it wasn't going to go for another year or nine months. And so it was kind of ideal. So while I was in Paris uh, working on Marie Antoinette, I couldn't get my preparation for Wild Things out of my mind. And I was trying to problem solve. And I was thinking of how in, in Spike's script, not in the, in the Marie Sendak book, there were a lot of buildings that uh, or our central building that the characters constructed. And I was trying to figure out how they constructed this thing. And I was looking at this corrugated cardboard. I was sitting in my apartment in, in Paris with all of this uh, samples of, you know, out of control pastel decoration from Marie Antoinette around and tearing cardboard apart and trying to look at it as, as if they were sticks and what mm. kind of a interesting hut that a uh, a creature that was intelligent and could speak, and yet still had the had the lack of tools that an animal had would make for this film. And so th that this was an experiment. That's what that's what that is. Well, it has life of its own. It's like a Richard Serra sculpture in itself. Yeah, I think it was a little overly intelligent in the end, but I had to go down this path. I had to make the mistakes, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I like that. I made a bunch of other ones in in uh, in white paper, and I was just enjoying myself. I was playing. I was being a kid, you know. Uh, there was no pressure. There was no timeline. I mm. was uh, just trying to figure out what tickled me. Yeah. And and uh, and so every night I would make uh, you know five or ten of these things and and then uh, stick them under a light and take a picture of them and set them aside. I think they all went in the trash and in Paris eventually. <clears throat> but it, it, kept me, uh, it kept me in tune. It kept me thinking about it. And uh, it, it was a joy. So yeah, it was, you know, it was a good exercise. This is a forest that uh, I found outside of Paris that we have a scene uh, with and Marie Antoinette, and I love this forest so much, and it and it it solved one of the problems I was looking for in where the wild things are. In that everybody kept saying, "Oh, where are you going to go to shoot wild things? Are you going to go to Hawaii? Are you going to go to the forest?" And I go like, "Well, 
I don't know. And I kept going to these places and, and they felt comforting because they were full of leaves and greenery and, and I wanted it to be wild. And I felt like this was more wild. And so after this, after Marie Antoinette, we started looking for forests and we weren't happy until we found one that was burnt. And you could see forever through it. It was no forest for the trees. It was, uh, it was infinity. And it looked wild and it had the coloration of the, of the creatures. And so, uh, in, you know, it's just advanced learning. I was kind of preparing my mind to, to be wild. Yeah. Well, this is very interesting to me that, that you mentioned, and we'll get back to Marie Antoinette in just a moment here. But uh, when, when, I, when I had mentioned over email a while back, you know, these two films, you had pointed out that, that it was an interesting choice because the two were kind of polar opposites and yet they found a way of influencing each other, right? Yeah, well, what, uh, in a way, the, the exercises for the wild things were my palate cleanser from uh, the exercises I was doing in Paris working on Marie Antoinette. I was doing a historical piece where we could break the rules and yet we still had expectations of matching uh, locations that were the real thing. And so mm. Mm. we couldn't, couldn't bend the rules too far, but uh, we could make companion choices to what existed in Versailles. And right. at the same time, I could get out of my head and go to the wild thing world. Marie Antoinette was also a follow-up on... Uh, I had never worked in Paris before. I'd never done a period film. And so in a way... Uh, it was another young girl exploring uh, a, a city and a world that she didn't know, much like Charlotte in uh, Lost in Translation, Marie Antoinette being thrust into this world of, of the Parisian court was another exploration that I could take as the character and find things that I liked about Paris and, and that period yeah, and include them. Nice. Let's go back to the sketch, Alan. I want to ask you um, real quick. Uh, this is kind of a craft question, so bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> I like craft. Um, this sketch, uh, it's, it's a lovely hand-drawn sketch. Do you, what are your thoughts on, on technology when it comes to creating renderings and draftings and all that? I didn't do this sketch. Um, I, I did a, a cruder sketch that uh, I love to sketch and I love to be expressive with my sketch, but I don't expect my sketches to be uh, <laughs> translatable always to somebody who has to build it or somebody has to say, uh, yes, you know, they, they, they want to see something finished. And mm. so I rely on illustrators to finish my, my crude ideas to a point where uh, production and, and director and camera and everybody understands what what the idea will be in its finished form. Um, right. I love really scrappy, sketchy stuff. I love uh, illustration that has emotion. Yes. Um, I find that a lot of technical illustration doesn't have that emotion. I also, you know, with the tools that we have today, often a illustrator can light a set terribly or they can light a set wonderfully they can add colors that shouldn't be there and and destroy the whole idea sometimes I look at my own idea and i go i can't stand that now because somebody put this magenta and cyan light in there hmm. um it looks like a disney film and so uh, illustrators go wild with color and and one of the main things i like to do in design is subtract 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 reduced down to a focus. We're trying to make people focus. We're try not trying to be make people lost in a crowd. And right. so um, I, I like reductive thinking and I like reductive design and I like reductive illustration. Yeah. I, I, every tool is great. You know, I don't, rather than talk about craft, let's talk about tools. Yes. Uh, you know, dig the digital world, the, the computer solutions to things they're tools and you know they're dumb at hammers until you pick it up and you decide what you're going to build with that hammer uh they they don't make this the uh 
solutions themselves. They're great when you want to make them do something that otherwise it would take you forever to do. They're great at undoing things and uh, showing different versions of things mm. and re realizing uh, a, a, an idea so it is translatable to a number of other people that otherwise couldn't see what you were talking about if you're talking in the abstract or talking in, in uh, napkin sketches. Yeah. But the hardest thing is, is to keep the emotion in them. And so I think it's the one thing that the tool doesn't give you and will never give you is uh, the emotion of, of the drawing. Some directors like a little bit of a rougher drawing because they don't want to be told exactly what it's going to look like. They don't want mm. to emulate to see the final result. They, they want to say, yeah, it's, I, I, I kind of like that. Much like I don't like storyboards that have the backgrounds drawn in. I'll supply a storyboard artist that's working with a director as many of the things that I know will be there so that they kind of get baked in and passed on and, and we start to see them in the environments. But if I don't have those things, the locations found yet or the sets designed yet, I don't want them to start showing up in the background because then they, they start getting baked in in the wrong way. And uh, the, sometimes the coldness of a sketch, like a lot of sketch up things, unless you really labor on a long time, first you have to build it and then paint it and then light it, and then you have to destroy it so that mm. it becomes emotional. Ah. You, kind of, you kind of have to mess it up. So uh, they're great. They're wonderful, wonderful tools. And I can't think of one that, that doesn't... Uh, get used in a good way. And I can't think of one that doesn't get used in a bad way. Ah, very good. Well, it's all about how you use the tool, right? Yeah. Now, yeah. I, I personally, I am somebody who is, I always have a pencil. Um, anything else is kind of too final in a way. <laughs> and there's this romance in this soul that correlates directly from your hand to the sheet of paper that is somehow eliminated with the computer, right? Yeah. So often. I mean, I mean you can also sketch with a with a you know a pen on a computer as well. Yeah. Uh, but I I I I'm I'm with you, you know. I carry a little book around in my back pocket uh, when I'm on a film and usually all the time anyway. And I'll whip it out in the middle of a conversation and start drawing and a director or a cameraman will start, will take the pen and start drawing on top of that. And that's such a beautiful way of communicating. And when you, you show that to somebody else, they'll go like, what the hell is that? <laughs> but everybody that was standing around contributing to that little abstraction understands exactly what those marks meant at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And I love, I love mistakes. If you, if you like to draw, and you've ever made a drawing that you, you like and it has energy and then you try and copy it, it's never the same. Right. It's, it's a living, breathing piece, yeah. right? Yeah. But people that say they can't draw, if you can write a signature, you can draw because your <laughs> signature is unique mm. and you've embraced it and, and uh, you know, you're fond of it and you're proud of it. Yeah. And that same kind of looseness is all you need for drawing. People just don't think of themselves as drawing as good as somebody that's classically trained, but that's old fashioned. Yeah. My drafting professor in New York was a guy named Atkin Pace who hand drafted the sets for like The Lion King on Broadway and uh, the producers and all these really like dense scenic shows. And he'd bring in these plates and it's just exquisite, like perfection with his pencil. And he would always teach us that we're not writing, but we are drawing our letters, you know? And that sort of mentality has never really left my mind. Any time the pencil goes to the paper, even if it's a grocery list, it's like drawing the letters, you know? It's like everything is sort of this, this kind of abstract correlation of thought to scribble, you know? Uh, that probably sounds ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe to somebody that doesn't draw, I, I totally get it. It makes a yeah. lot of sense to me. And also, uh, I want to I take this moment to anybody watching who says they can't draw 
Anybody can draw. Anybody can, right? Wouldn't you yeah. agree? Anybody can. Everybody can draw, just like everybody has ideas. Yeah. Um, uh, Kid Koala, who I did a project with. Okay, we'll, we'll uh, jump he loves, to that. He loves to draw. He's a beautiful, you know, creative person and, and an incredible musician, but he also is a very uh, personal uh, uh, illustrator, you know, and he makes this uh, series of concerts called Music to Draw By. Mm. And he creates music and encourages everybody just to come and draw. That's amazing. Yeah. So while you're on the topic of Kid Koala, I want to bring this image up here. This is a um, project you worked on with him that is really fascinating to me. I spent like the week kind of just diving into this thing. So this is like a genre defying theater music film piece. Can you sort of give us uh, insight into, into the world of what this is, what this live experience is? Let me, let me set it up first by saying that music kind of never left me. I always mm -hmm. had a foot in music, even though uh, at, at a certain point in my life, uh, film took over and the demands of film because you're on a project every day for nine months to a year. But yeah. uh, I still have a lot of musician friends and one of those friends who I, who I got close with when I was working on another project uh, similar to this, but prior to this, which was called Stop the Virgins, one of the musicians in the band, uh, Money Mark, who's known as the keyboard player in the Beastie Boys, uh, said, uh, you gotta meet this guy. He's, he's playing down the street from us. Uh, Mark lives by me. And so we went down to this show that Kid Koala was putting on and I met him and, uh, and he said, oh, we got to do something. And I said, yeah, let's do something. And he sent me this graphic novel of uh, Newphonia Must Fall, which is a story of a robot that's being phased out because he's not, uh, he's not this year's model, he's last year's model. Mm. And he's kind of a sad sack and, and bumps from job to job and can't really find a place in the world. He's an old tool. And uh, he falls in love with this girl and then sadly later finds out and then, and then also has a rival the new model of robot and he sadly finds out that this girl that he's kind of starting to date and is in love with designed the new model of robot his nemesis uh. and she may have designed him too which is a little edible but uh <laughs> uh anyway so everything so, goes back to the greeks right <laughs> yeah so so <laughs> So uh, Eric, Kid Koala, uh, says, okay, let's, let's do this. What do you want to do on it? And I said, you know, I, I kind of want to direct it. And so I came up with this idea. Let's do it live action, and we can have these characters on stage and in, these, in costumes like you see in this, in this frame. That's his nemesis in the background there. Mm. And, uh, and, and I had this whole split screen idea and forward and backwards and something that I was trying to play with, with uh, Stop the Virgins, but we didn't do it, which was having actors recede into darkness and then show up on a film above them and then come back into the foreground and, uh, rec and recede from the, from the film. And he said, oh, well, I, you know, I was kind of planning on doing it with puppets. And this goes back to your puppet question. And, I, you know, Usually when I've done something, I'm done with it. I've done it and I, I don't really want to go back. I explored it to the, to the end and, and moved on. And we had puppets in, uh, in Tonight Tonight in the, in the uh, Smashing Pumpkins video. Mm -hmm. And then we had puppets in Being John Malkovich, of course. And so we had puppets here again. But he, he laid out such a great case and introduced me to these, these wonderful people in, in Montreal where he's based. And I said, okay, this, this is great. I mean, if that's your idea, let's do it. Let's, uh, let's do it with puppets. And then uh, as a director, what I tried to do was, and, and he also came up with the concept that this would be a film and there would be minim, miniature multiple sets down below the screen and we'd be making the film with these puppets and these sets. Mm. at the same time that it's being shown on screen live. Really and, cool. And the music would be made, that's a string quartet down below, 
and then Eric is off to the left with keyboards and turntables. He's he's mainly known as a as a genius turntablist. Mm. And if you, if you haven't seen what he can do, it's nothing like anybody else that you know of under that title can do. And so uh, we got some funding. His manager drummed up some funding from a, a bunch of different festivals that this would you know have a, a first preview at. And we went up to Banff in Canada and 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 got a grant to put it together and workshop it for a month. And then it's been touring the world for about five years. It's an incredible project and such a great thing to jump out of from what I normally do. Mm, absolutely. Uh, and I uh, I think first they wanted to use string puppets or or, or hand puppets and, and I convinced them to use rod puppets from below so that we quickly got into believing that they were real entities and we saw less of the mechanics. But at the same time, the audience can see the puppeteers below those sets working those characters. That's really cool. Is that a realm that you'd like to work more in down the line? Uh, again, it was just something I'd never done. So it was a challenge and it was really exciting. I, 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 uh, I would like to do more theater, yeah. I yeah. found it a, a really good exploration. Um, so I want to talk briefly about the future. We're coming up on an hour here. Okay. But uh, before I talk about the real future that we're all kind of in the world that we're living in at the moment, I want to talk about a future you created for a film called Her. Um, if we could bring up this image. Um, there's something about this movie that really resonates emotionally. It, maybe it's this natural light, but but there's such warmth and, and comfort somehow in this isolation. Um, and the city sort of defies any city we know in some strange way. What was it like collaging the future for this film? Uh, well, a, a number of these ideas were, were Spike's main touchstones. Uh, one was that he wanted to make, he wanted it set in Los Angeles. He wanted it set slightly of a time ahead of ours, but he didn't, there was no uh, specificity about when it was. Mm. It wasn't next year. It wasn't 20 years. It was, well, I think we started with 15 years and then we got it down to one technological release forward, like one OS ahead of us, which meant six months, you know, nine months. Um, this was a great exercise in taking away what didn't belong. So everything, most of the things you see in the film are really there. That's a view of Los Angeles that really exists. That's, that's a, uh, a building that really exists with a view like that. Um, outside the other window, we've added some buildings, but in that one, that's an honest portrayal. Mm. And uh, it, it's an emotional story. It's a story about loneliness. It's a story about somebody with all the comforts uh, that you can have that the future might give you. And this was, this was Spike's main idea was that this character has everything. He doesn't have to worry about money. He's got a good job. He's got a good uh, city that he lives in. He's got good food that he can access. It wasn't about social strife. It was about a personal social dilemma, which is he couldn't find his way to uh, find love with another character. And so he explored uh, different things that modern uh, technology may supplant real human connection with. And that's what the story is about. And so anything that didn't belong to that story was taken away. Mm. And to set up this city, what I did was just not try not to show anything that was made before 1990. Um, I mean, that was a general touchstone. There were some buildings that were certainly made before 1990, but they didn't look to have a history that was older than that. And then when we went to Shanghai, we finally landed on Shanghai as our alternate parallel city. Um, we were in an area that was also built in 1990 and forward. And so it was kind of an ideal marriage of the two and shanghai is the same age as los angeles is originally um it was interesting i think that uh, the future uh, people that don't like the present don't deserve the future because this this was a film about the future and it was set in the present 
and everything in the in the film you can have now it exists in some way uh you have high speed trains you have you don't have an intelligent operating system to the degree that's self-taught like this one is that's the only exception but you have all those other comforts to some degree now everybody doesn't live like that we've got homeless people we've got uh people struggling with uh to get jobs and and struggling with their food source and all kinds of things like that but for that particular story that was important to take those things away so that we focused on his dilemma and not the world or society's dilemma very good um thank you for waxing poetic on that for a moment <laughs> there's a uh I, I so here's a question i have from from my friend in in bulgaria and i want to bring this up because i'm also curious it's a bit of a diversion from where we are right now in the conversation but the converse of marie antoinette moments like that that kind of are inserted into these films. That one in particular, was that your idea to kind of bring a, a bit of this modern sensibility to, to the past? No, that was Sophia's idea. That was, um, she, I mean, think about it. Think about the music that's in that film. You know, that, oh, movie, that, that music is not from that time. Um, uh, she insisted on having pastels, not deep colors. Uh, she wanted it to be, uh, a young person's world in that court and imagine what it would be like for a young person. You know, they wanted to hang out at night. They wanted to get drunk. They wanted to party. They didn't really want to take care of uh, the, the strict rules of, of the court. And yeah. So that, that was her idea. And at one point we had another idea and I don't know whose it was, but it was kind of collective. Uh, it might've been mine or Sophia's or, or Lance Accords to uh, put a Rolls Royce in the back of the scene that you just showed the illustration of with the tent party at night. Yeah, here's an image of it. <clears throat> and yeah, so we had a Rolls Royce and we kept looking for the right Rolls Royce. We wanted a, a, a like a 1966 white Rolls Royce, one of the larger ones. And we wanted it just peeking in the background there, not as blatant as the full frame pair of Converse t -shirt, tennis shoes. But we wanted it to be a parallel between the bling now and the bling then. Yeah. And uh, we couldn't find the Rolls Royce. The one they, they brought to us was kind of butter yellow with a brown <laughs> vinyl top. And it just, didn't, it just didn't say the same thing that we were trying to say. And we had it parked back there. And the, the people at Versailles were aghast that we would try to do something like that. Um, but I'm sure just like the destruction <laughs> of her, of her bedroom at the end. Right. Which was, well, the people really did that, you know, and, and <laughs> right, that's, a, that's a set. So right, can, but that's what I mean is it all had to be kind of recreated. Right? Yeah. That that's a set that we had to recreate. So, uh, it, it just, you know, the, the, and, and another idea that Sophia had was she wanted to open the film with Marie Antoinette in her bath, blowing a bubblegum bubble and popping it. So you knew right away, this is not your historical drama that you're used to. So put your notebook away and quit looking for errors. Yeah. But, but it's, it's creativity. It's like every film, um, that wasn't a, that wasn't a documentary. It wasn't a, it wasn't an honest historical academic, you know, uh, guidebook to Marie Antoinette. Yeah. That was a story about a young girl and her feelings and, and a, in a forced marriage. And yeah. uh, that's what the film was about. And you had to stay true to that. And all those other ideas, you can get distracted. You can go down those rabbit holes of like, is this period correct? And you're not paying attention to what the story is about. You got to make yeah. sure what is the story about? What are, what's the journey here? Well, the relevance sort of persists through today. Tell me about this picture real quick. Yeah. <laughs> that's... That's me, uh -huh. Dress, dressed, uh, there, I gave you another picture of uh, two boats in a fountain. Oh, and yeah. so one of the amusements that, uh, there you go, that's me oh, as that's well. Oh, that's the one there. That's me in the, in the, in the fountain. Uh, the so, lamp lighter. Huh? Well, there's cannons on the boat. Oh. I, was, I was lighting the cannons and the cannons, right. it was a mock naval battle and, and the two boats would uh, you know, attack each other and, and for the amusement of the court, which you see in the background. And this was an interesting thing because these boats cost about $15,000 to make. 
And it was an idea that we came up with, and it was such a I, such a lovely idea. And the, and uh, the line producer says, like, I can't give you fifteen thousand dollars for a couple boats in a fountain, you know. And yeah. I said, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll bet you it makes the trailer. And if it's good enough to make the trailer, then it's good enough to put in the movie. There you go. And spend the money on because it meant that it was one of those moments where you do get the uh, audience's attention again with production design and you do have some fun. And that's why the person that cut the trailer picked it because it looked crazy and outrageous. And mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you just have to do that. Yeah. And you did shoot the majority of this film in, in France, right? It was all shot in uh, in Paris and all of it and and surrounds and Versailles. Yeah, nice, very cool. Well, KK, I have one final question for you. Uh, what is your hope for the future of storytelling? Ah, uh, you you carefully uh, curb that <laughs> from picked industry. Picked up on that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, storytelling, well, you know, it's ancient. It'll it'll never go away. It, it's it's uh, it's about the human condition. It's about you know things that touch us. Uh, people see themselves in stories, and that's why they're engaged with them. Um, if you want to be on uh, the assembly line, do those kind of movies, and they'll have less emotion, but you'll go for a ride. Uh, if you want to be in the industry, but I think that uh, the more personal stories will always have a place in the and the more they they touch people rather than just push them back in their seats then uh, it'll be one of the things that's more unique in the future as things become more homogenized if you want to get into future casting uh, when more things are done for or us uh, our emotions will never be taken care of that's mm. our, our responsibility wow very profound and very true very true um, thank you so much for the generosity of your time. I'm, I regret we didn't even get to touch on, on some of your other films, but uh, I guess that just means we'll have to have you back in the studio some other time. <laughs> uh, it was fun. It was there's, fun. There's a method to the madness. <laughs> so yeah. I'll see you in just a moment in the uh, virtual green room, but uh, thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. And to all of you at home or wherever you are, thank you for watching. Please do us all a favor, stay safe, stay home, wear a mask, and, um, and all that good stuff. My next guest will be announced shortly. Until then, be well and have a wonderful Saturday wherever you are. Bye-bye.